Hey, thank you for joining SparkCon 2020 as we move through the week. It's Wednesday, and we also have several different episodes in this conference going on. Today, we're going to be talking about some of the things around caverns and with Cavern Solutions and Dr. Joel Warnicke, and also talking about what you need to look for in the mining operations. He's been involved in the industry for 16 years and has a wealth of knowledge about this subject. And if you're unaware of what is, what is going on in the industry in this particular area, this is the solution and this is the episode that you want to check out and visit. Also, just to let you know, you have the opportunity to drop questions in the chat. And our goal is to make sure that you ask and answer your questions and we have an opportunity to have that conversation so you can understand some of the things that are involved. And if this is your first time on SparkCon 2020, register for the other episodes, find out what's involved and engaged in this community and all the wealth of knowledge that's going on. And uh, I just wanted to welcome you to the episode. And Dr. Joel, thank you so much for being here. And uh, what are you going to be sharing with us today? Yeah, uh, thanks to Spark Thought and thanks to Russ for the introduction. Uh, my name is Joel Warnicke and I'm Vice President at Cavern Solutions. Um, I got a lot of letters behind my name, but I just consider myself a salt miner and underground storage expert. Um, what we're going to look at today is reducing risk, uh, integrity of underground storage assets, uh, and particularly in salt. Uh, what we're talking about does transfer very well to reservoirs, um, but we're going to look at some examples in salt today and then we can go from there. So first off, where is this salt that we're talking about? Um, and if we, this is a map of North America and we can see that there's many salt deposits across North America into Central America. In almost every one of these salt basins, we are storing or producing brine, storing hydrocarbons or producing brine uh, for petrochemical use. And so each one of them comes with its own difficulties, uh, but it's something that with engineering and science, we can overcome the difficulties to ensure that we contain the products where we want to put them. So let's take a closer look at what, what, what this salt looks like. And on the Gulf Coast, we have a, a kind of a unique feature. These things are called salt domes. Uh, we have a mother salt that's around 20,000 feet deep. And due to geologic pressure, it actually creates salt masses that come up nearly to surface or at surface. Um, and so the picture on the right is actually a 3D image of a salt dome in Louisiana. Uh, what we did is we shot 3D seismic, processed it, interpreted it and then tied it to all the wells. And for scale, the length of the dome itself is about five miles and it's about three miles in width. So these features are large. And we said, you know, if we think to ourselves, well, where are these? Well, the easiest example is in Houston, Texas, underneath Reliance Stadium is a salt dome called Pierce Junction. And that salt dome actually is an active storage facility. Uh, so we have them all throughout the Gulf Coast, including within the city limits of Houston. Um, and so, you know, they're features that we use readily. So now that we've looked at, you know, what is a salt dome, what do we do with this thing? And what happens is that we take a lot of time in engineering and we actually build what's called a salt cavern. The, what's on the screen right now is a, a well bore schematic and anybody in the oil and gas industry is fairly familiar with this because it looks close to what we would do for oil and gas. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to take you through a little bit of a cavern building. Um, so we, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we protect our USDW and then any, uh, any intervals that are are important or need to be protected or our difficulty we set behind casing we set concentric strings so what that means is we start with our largest string and we taper the strings to fit inside each other until our last cemented strings in salt now most regulatory bodies require us to have two cemented strings in salt and this is in case one of these strings fails we still have containment of our hydrocarbons so let's go quickly through the building process of a cavern the other thing to note is how big are these caverns they are the largest man-made underground structures in the world um, for example the astrodome in texas is five million barrels of space 
when we build caverns, we usually build between three and five million barrel caverns. So they are extremely large. We have built as an industry caverns as large as 60 to 70 million barrels. Um, and so we build extremely large unsupported openings uh, in the ground using these techniques. So this is just a closer look of our set casings. Um, we, you know, the sizes are large. Um, and this one is a 16 inch. We just are in, in the process of planning a 24 inch final completion. Um, and that's based on customer needs. Um, so, you know, we can look at every size, every need, and we tailor those solutions. The, the unique part of it is, is once we are in salt, we actually run two hanging strings. And in a second, you're going to see why. But we need the two hanging strings for control of a hydrocarbon pad, which limits our upward growth of our mining and control of our water and brine. Because what we do is we put fresh water into the salt and it actually uh, solution mines the salt from the mass. So, um, so we seal it with a hydrocarbon pad. It doesn't let our growth go up any higher than that. We push fresh water in the inner string and we take brine returns out the other annulus. And that creates our first part of our growth of a cavern. Um, and we do this several times and adjusting the blankets, adjusting the strings until we get to where we want our size and shape of our caverns. Um, what we then do is we remove the hydrocarbon blanket, we remove these strings, and we run a single brine string into the cavern. Uh, and at this point, we are ready for hydrocarbon storage. We can then push hydrocarbons in and take the brine out through the string, or we can push brine in and push the hydrocarbons out through this annulus. So in this way, we can move a ton of hydrocarbons, um, different fractionated products, natural gases, other sorts of things um, uh, in and out of these fairly safe uh, environments. So with that said, as an industry and as our company, we've done several recent risk assessments uh, of storage facilities. And you know what we've done is we've looked at the facilities and then we looked at possible events that could happen and the effects if those ha events were to happen. Um, and the most serious event that is, you know, is of note is contamination of groundwater due to upward migration of the product. Because if we were to ever contaminate a groundwater, it's almost impossible to fully clean it up back to standards. And so you'd have a situation where almost for perpetuity, you would be cleaning up uh, an aquifer to try to get it back to usable standards. What we found is, and this may sound scary, is, is that in the absence of human intervention, meaning that we just build it, we just fill it full of hydrocarbons, and then we leave it there with nothing, the storage system or the cavern we just built is going to fail. Um, well, obvious, right? Uh, almost everything that's man-made is going to fail. Um, you know, it, it just happens. But what we also found out through this whole thing is, is that if we intervene as humans, and we're just talking basic maintenance, the probability of failure of one of these caverns is diminishes considerably uh, to the point where the risk of leakage associated with our salt cavern storage is extremely low. Um, now, with that said, the consequences if something happens is really high, but the likelihood... Uh, just due to our normal everyday maintenance and our paying attention to it as humans uh, makes it the likelihood of that low. With that said, there are significant events in our industry. Our industry is fairly new. Um, 1940s were the first time we stored hydrocarbons in salt caverns. And in fact, those caverns are still in, in use today. Um, we've had some bigger events. Um, we have had fatalities. Uh, and it's just something we want to truly avoid. Um, so let's just take a couple, look at a couple of these closer. Um, in the case of here, it was a wellhead was selected wrong and the wellhead actually failed, uh, failed at the Braden head. And we had to do a, a big intervention uh, to seal off the cavern and then get our, the, replace the wellhead. Um, and so this is a big snubbing unit. And this is just because we chose the wrong equipment. Uh, as an industry, not myself. 
in this case right here, a brine cavern was too close to the edge of a salt dome and something caused the cavern to fail. Uh, at the end of the day, as we can see, there is a nice new surface feature from the failed cavern. Uh, an image on the left is we've got the edge of salt depicted with the cavern in place and something somewhere happened here and we had a failure of the sidewall. Um, this is the well pad the cavern was on. So the sinkhole that happened is not directly over the top of a cavern. So we do know that the event followed the edge of the dome. Um, and that's what we have there. Last but not least is slightly different. This is a case of where we overfilled a cavern um, and the some hydrocarbon got into the brine system and ignited. Um, the explosion was felt downtown Houston um, and there was fatalities associated with this. So uh, every one of these incidences that we're looking at has led to higher regulations. Um, and we as an industry, you know, had to step back and reevaluate our practices. So, so this is just a, a little bit of a side note, but right now uh, the midstream storage is looking for more space. And I wanted to put this in here just so everybody is, is up front. When we start a project with difficult geologic conditions, then the monitoring requirements to ensure that we have integrity greatly increases. For an example here, we've got a nice section of top of dome that sits here, but the other part of the top of the dome has been mined with, for sulfur. The sulfur mining has liquid sulfur still sitting there and poses great risk for us eating our concentric strings, not from the inside out, but from the outside in. Uh, there's also drilling risks and other things. Now those can be mitigated, but if we have the opportunity to move our sites to a nice clean salt uh, or a nice clean site, it, it should be looked at and these need to be addressed before our projects start. Um, and you know, this is just vertical cross section showing the sulfur mined area and that there are opportunities that we don't have to get into that sulfur. This is an interesting chart. Uh, what I did was I sponsored uh, U of H senior design in, in uh, petroleum engineering. And at the time I had sponsored that, we were writing API 1170 and API 1171, which is storage of natural gas and hydrocarbon in salt. Uh, and in reservoirs. And I asked my students, what should we do to monitor for integrity of a gas cavern? Um, and I, I gave them guidance and I gave them other things. And what they came back was actually this very simplistic chart, uh, but it's pretty important. Uh, if we look at regulatory, in, especially in the state of Texas, we have a 15 year cycle where we start and finish and we should be take, you know emptying our cavern and starting over with a brine MIT. And during each one of those increments, we should be doing something and collecting data to ensure that we are having integrity of our system during this whole 15 year cycle. Uh, and each one of these items actually feeds into the decision ma making process to say, do we need to have more interventions? Do we need to have less interventions? Um, or are we, you know, ensuring that we are keeping the hydrocarbon in place. Um, and it's the sort of chart that we should look at as an industry on each individual asset, because just because we have this in general, it needs to be fit to each individual cavern because some caverns may be 60 years old and need more interventions and some caverns may be brand new and don't need quite the amount of interventions to ensure that we have integrity. So what I want to look at is, is a, a couple of, underutilized techniques really quick. Uh, and I think they're extremely important. Uh, and they, they're basically the only techniques that we have that are directly uh, measuring the activity of the salt and you know the structures around it. So the first thing is, is seismic monitoring. Uh, and this technique has been going on in, in France and other places uh, since the early 2000s with computing power and, you know, the data storage getting cheaper, it's easier for us to, you know, to start to use some of these techniques. And what is, what this is, is in Manosque, France, is they have a salt deposit that is overlaid by a lot of faulting and a lot of, uh, just difficult geology. And so within it, they're storing hydrocarbons. They are worried that if something happened in the overlying geology of a large, magnitude, what would happen to our caverns? So they installed a wonderful seismic network and they've been publishing a great number of papers. But what we can see is that we have, 
along this salt boundary, we have a lot of events. And then around our caverns, we actually have events happening due to the salt moving around our caverns and interacting with the space that we've created. This is very important. Uh, what we've also saw is, is that the most seismic activity happens is during our leaching and new cavern building. And this makes sense is because as we're building this space, we're changing the stresses in the salt. And it takes a bit for those stresses to be able to settle down and say, okay, we've got a nice stable space. Uh, but we wanna pay attention is, is when we actually go into injection withdrawal of our hydrocarbons, that we are pay that every one of these events, whether it's large or small, we start to try to figure out what's going on and what's it's telling us about downhole. So even though we don't have the magnitude, each one of these events is telling us something about what's happening. What, how big are these events and what are we talking about? Um, you know, if we look at the big ones, we've got Chile, we've got, you know, which are, are you know, big, you know, the whole country is kind of ruptured. At the end of the day, what we're talking about is the, the events that are around our caverns are like the size of a pistol shot. So, you know, maybe a rifle shot. So there's a lot of energy released, but it's not on the order of the, you know, we're, we're, we're acquiring a lot of damage. But if we have a ton of these, then, you know, we could be damaging our caverns. Uh, the other thing is, is that we are able to pick up casing strings parting. We're able to pick up, uh, you know, all sorts of other wonderful things that are, you know, telling us we have integrity. Um, and so this is just another slide telling us how big these events are. Uh, the example that we showed of the, at Napoleonville of that failure, the manager of that facility did feel earthquakes on the surface. So we know that we had a, a upwards of a magnitude two event, but almost every event after that was in the 0.5 to minus two size range. Um, and so, you know, there are lots of those events. It's tough for us to get something larger than a two um, just because of uh, the physics of earthquakes. So what are our possible areas for seismicity? Uh, what we can do is we can see that we have cap rock and subsidence and differential movement. And, you know, what we what we get is, is, uh, you know, we're, we want to pay attention because our strings are running through the cap rock. And so if our cap rock changes, we could be damaging our strings. We can see collapses and failures because we are too close to the edge of the dome. We can see events during our creation of our cavern. And then we can also see events during our storage uh, aspect. So no matter what happens, if something's moving in the salt, we have the ability to pick it up. And it's important for us to pay attention to that. The other uh, technique that is not utilized to its fullest extent uh, is seismic monitoring or subsidence monitoring. Uh, we are required by regulation uh, to look for the subsidence over the top of the dome. And in most cases, we take one subsidence measurement every year, we get a report, we put look at the report and we put it on the shelf. But the power of a more frequent subsidence monitoring is actually that we can see the behavior of the salt and the surroundings as we're operating these caverns. Um, so we'll look at that. Um, we are in PDF, so we can't look at this animation, but I would love to share this animation with anybody else. But what it is, is that we have a gas field that is underneath a town and over time, as gas is injected into the formation and withdrawn, we can see that the field goes up and down in an elastic manner. Um, and it's important because if the field changes from an elastic manner to a brittle failure, we know that a fault activated or we may be losing hydrocarbon to a different formation. Uh, and it, you know, especially when it over is over the top of a, of a town or underneath a town. So um, these sorts of things are, very good for us. Um, right now, this is a map of Mont Bellevue, and we are looking at subsidence rates. Uh, the darker red is means that we have higher subsidence, and the lighter greens means that we have less subsidence. Um, and that's just an example that we're going to use. The, we picked out a couple interesting spots. So in the in the red here, we're going to look at an individual time series. And what we did is we averaged all of the subsidence measurements inside that red, and we can see that. During part of the year, we had a nice trend of subsidence going down, and all of a sudden, the subsidence flattened out. Now, this isn't an error in measurement. 
what it actually is, is a change of use of the caverns in that area. They actually leach the caverns in this area for part of the year. And then for the other part of the year, they are idled. Um, and before that, we didn't know, you know what was going on and be able to tell the story. Um, and then this is just another part, which is a little bit south. Um, and in this case, we had, were idled during the first part of the year, and then we had increased subsidence during the second part of the year. Uh, and so by looking at this and seeing if our trends are changing with our operational use, we can see if something downhole has changed, which then we should investigate further to see if we're losing integrity. Um, and then these are just some cross sections, some cross plots. We can see that in the A to B, we've got lower subsidence to higher subsidence. We can see the change in slope. Um, and then B to C or C to D, we can see that things change also. So we have a ton of power in data that can be collected. It's just whether we as operators or as consultants want to use that to help in, you know, with integrity. Okay, so let's go to a more typical. Um, and in this case, casing inspection logs. So the, this is where we actually get to see whether our product is being contained within our cavern. So this is a typical suite of casing inspection logs, a bond log, a multi-finger palper, and in this case, a vertilog from Baker Hughes. Now, the power is in each individual log, but the problem we have is if we just have a caliper, sometimes it's tough for us to see what's going on, or sometimes if we just have a bond log, it's tough for us to see what's going on. Where we take it and we integrate all of the logs into one composite, we can look on depth to see whether a feature is actually coming through with all the logs. And so it's important for us to collect the data and then look at it in many different ways so that if there is something like a thinning of a wall at a collar, we can then do interventions to ensure that we didn't lose integrity. Okay, so this is something that uh, we do and we have to do by regulation is we monitor pressures of our caverns. Now, what normally happens is, is that while the cavern is being built, we look for high pressures and low pressures. We don't really take a look at what's going on in between. And we can see that we've got lots of peaks, lots of valleys, what's happening, why is it happening? And these are, are things that need to be asked of the operators. Is this real data? Did we have outages? Do we have a valve that was closed? Uh, all those have to be answered because if some of these features are real, then there's something wrong downhole. Um, and we just have to take a closer look. And we'll show an example of a micro analysis of some of this data in just a couple slides. Now, sometimes we idle a cavern for quite a long a time. And what happens during that time is that we get a lot of data, the behavior of the salt, especially around the cavern. And we can see that over time, the pr cavern pressure increases slowly, and then we have to bleed the cavern off. What we should see is that each one of the slopes of these pressure ups needs to be identical. Um, if they change slope, something down hole change and the behavior of the salt is different and th that warrants further investigation. The other thing to note is, is that there are times when the pressure of the cavern doubled. We have to either flag those earlier and say, is this real? And if it is, we can't have that. Or is it instrumentation error and it still needed to be corrected? So we have to take, you know, all those sorts of stuff into account. So what does it look like when we take and we, you know, we instrument a site for, you know, intensive data integration and intensive data analysis? And this is kind of what it looks like. We can instrument almost any site. And this is one of the most difficult instrumentations uh, that was done. And it's in the middle of a, a lake. And what we have here is we have geophones installed. We have subsidence satellite monuments that have been installed. And then on the tree itself, a tilt meter has been installed with an alarm. So if this tree was to fall, uh, it can alarm people that a tree is falling. Um, and what do we use that for? What we use it for is something like this. What we noticed is that the cavern pressure, and we saw those big diagrams, the cavern pressure actually at an instantaneous point jumped to PSI. Now, that normally would be overlooked. And in fact, when you look at a normal operator screen, you wouldn't see it. But we actually had code written to look for any instantaneous losses or any instantaneous jumps and flag those. We also then picked up several seismic events during that exact same time period. So what happened? 
Well, it just so happened we were lucky enough to have run a have a sonar called out and we can see what happened down hole. In the case here, the figure in the black was a sonar that was done a month before on this cavern. The red is the sonar that happened at the exact uh, about three days after the event. And what we can see is, is that this huge chunk of salt in the red fell out and caused a, an, a void opening. Now in an operating cavern, now we'll put it into example, the cavern was extremely large and this mass of salt was 500,000 barrels of salt and a very large salt fall. Um, this sort of thing would be detrimental if we were in storage operations. It would wipe out brine strings. It would cause fluctuations of, of hydrocarbons. It would cause mixing. There's some things that would be good. And for the first time ever, we collected the correct data to say something downhole happened. And then we can use those learnings and go on with time to, to help ensure that this doesn't have, or we, we can flag that facilities. So then let's go back to this, you know, all this data needs to be evaluated and integrated on a daily, it is a daily process because we are collecting pressure data. We are collecting, you know, ins and outs of caverns and those have to be integrated into each one of these steps to ensure that we have integrity of our system. Uh, and if we don't have integrity of our system, we don't understand what's going on down hole, bad things can happen and they cost lots of money and they could be fatalities and we don't like bad stuff. Uh, so each one of our steps needs to be looked at, needs to be evaluated and thought about, and it has to be fine tuned for each one of your assets. The last thing we want to look at is institutional knowledge. And this is a big topic and it's been a topic for a while. Uh, and what we're ha seeing is, is that knowledge from facilities is going away and it's not being collected and it's not being addressed. And and the reason for that is if we look at this, this is a 15 year cycle. So knowledge that has to be collected and these cycles can go on many times. So first time, second time, so 45 years, even that old data feeds into what goes on here and we can't lose that knowledge. It has to be collected and it has to be preserved. And what happens is that we have mergers and acquisitions. We have retirements, we have employees leaving, we have pandemics and we have new and inexperienced operators. Uh, and so, you know, for example, we just helped a company through a merger acquisition when they got there and, you know, from when they got to the file room after the acquisition, most of the files were missing. Um, and was it because they weren't collected? Is it, was it because, you know, and that's just data that's just gone. We, you can't recreate that data. What happens if you have a retiree and he didn't put anything on the server and it was all on his own computer and he walks out with all of that data? Or what happens if you have a retiree that has a file cabinet full of files and never did anything electronically, but knew where everything was and ran everything perfectly, but you don't understand his filing system. Those have to be addressed before the guy retires. Employees leaving. This happens more than you'd think. Employees leave, they download all the data and they delete the data. Or employees leave and they didn't file stuff. Uh, and it, it's a, it, things, processes have to be put in place. Now, this is kind of a topic, interesting topic because it's so politicized, but I'll give you an example of the pandemic. So right now we're going through COVID and with our small industry, we've lost several key figures due to COVID. Uh, a facility that I basically started working at, one of the managers there passed and he was the only person that knew where all the underground piping was at the whole facility. There was no as built. And so if you ever needed to do any modifications, he would say, well, take 20 paces off the fence line and there's your pipe. Well, now you don't have the ability to collect that knowledge and you have to go start basically at square one to try to collect your as built. Um, you know, and the last but not least is we need to train our operators to be able to look at data when things are changing, not just looking at our high values or low values of pressure, not just looking at inflows and outflows, but are they changing on a daily basis? Are those things changing and, you know, becoming confusing? Um, you know, are, are we getting the best out of, you know, the data that's coming in? And so we have to make sure that those operators are trained to perform at a certain level, but also notice when things are changing at our asset. So. Uh, well, over the last slide, you know, this is one I use quite a bit. Um, and some people ask why, but this is the case of the sinkhole in Louisiana. They made front page of CNN.com. And I use it because you, first off, you don't want your, 
your facility on the front page of CNN.com. But I'll be honest, you, there's chances that if that is your facility and you're the manager of the facility, you, there'll be days that you may look like Randy Travis in the middle of that picture. Um, the sleepless nights, the worries, the ulcers, um, you know, reassuring, you know, your employees that everything's all right. It's not a fun place to be. So, um, you know, with that said, I appreciate Spark Thought for uh, letting me give this presentation. And I saw a couple questions come in, uh, but they disappeared. So I don't know where they went. But if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to address them. Yes, uh, Michael Norris has a question. How would we contact you to see the animation or for any consulting needs? Yeah, uh, cavernsolutions.com is our website. Uh, and then it's first name, first joel.warnicky at cavernsolutions.com is my email. Um, I am on LinkedIn. Uh, I've been told by uh, Spark thought that my LinkedIn isn't very good. So we'll be addressing my LinkedIn presence soon. Uh, okay. But other than that, contact me after the show. Yeah, contact me after the show. So. Yeah. So we'll be sharing that information out as well. Uh, Spark thought I'll be doing that. And so the gas animation there is. Uh, oh, cool. It's on. Yeah. Fantastic. So, yeah, so that's, that's a fascinating uh, bit of information. And so maybe you could explain uh, to, to, to the audience for those that are listening in or in the future that may not be uh, fully vested in the, in the industry. Uh, what we're actually seeing here. Yeah. Uh, so Rob Spark uh, asked a question, what's your optimal monitoring data interval for effective risk mitigation? I can tell you straight up, it, it probably, it depends on what we're looking at. Uh, for subsidence monitoring, if we don't know the facility, we usually collect data on four day intervals. Um, for pressure data, we collect down to probably 10th of a second. Um, you know, when we, put it out on an operator screen, it's usually, you know, to every five seconds or every second, but we, tr we try to get as, as much resolution as we can. If we look at micro seismic networks, you know, we're collecting 3000 to 6000 samples a second. So it depends on what we need to have and what we're, we're trying to go and what we're trying to do. Uh, what should we do as far as getting together and integrating that data? Once again, it depends on the age of our facility and the problems we're seeing. But at least quarterly things should be looked at and integrated and all the data looked at. Um, and then, of course, yearly, because there's a lot of reports that come in yearly. And so, you know, as a, as a group, you should sit down and evaluate your caverns, at least on a yearly basis. This changed. This didn't change. This feature of our casing inspection changed. Uh, the amount of product that went in and out of it, does that, does that affect us? There's a bunch of questions that should be asked. Uh, and, you know, those are things that should be addressed. Well, especially since these facilities are, you know, some expecting or anticipating on being decades in use. And so looking at trends and those those micro changes are going to be important for the operator to understand what actually is taking place. And if there is something that they need to intervene and control, uh, I, I I have to believe that that's something that they have to be. Able to do. Right. Is it now with of data and that amount of uh, volume of data is there are there uh is the industry looking at tools and ai and some of the things that are available um, in, in data analytics that uh, is going to help us in the future for expanding that information yeah the answer is in some cases yes but they should be uh you know what's been a real limiting factor in the past has been data storage you know on ser on-site servers those things like that um, you know, if we look at recently, we've got something, what's that, what's the new hot IPO? Um, I don't remember my brother works for him, but you, we have unlimited data storage now, you know, cloud storage is there, the ability to take this data and have, you know, the super smart programmers write functions in to say, do we have instantaneous change of pressures? Do we have instantaneous events? Do we have events that are overlapping and flag those so that our cavern engineers can review them and say, did something actually happen? All of that is there and the ability for it to learn. What's tough is that in the initial stages are really, we get a lot of false positives, a lot of false negatives and that each site there's this, this learning curve. But what's, what's amazing is our machine learning is, is really, really getting 
is getting good. And you know, our, our the time that to learn a facility and what is real and what's not is no longer two years. It could yeah. be a couple months. So we could have something really sophisticated up and running, monitoring your facility and having real um, things that we should look at, you know, within a month or two. Are there peaks and valleys in the education process uh, as it relates to the data itself? Like, are there certain aspects of the data that you need, need to really drill into and, and discover and mm. pay attention to versus, you know, looking at that volume of data? There has to be something that you have to pick out over time. Yeah. Like if there's flooding or if there's groundwater, high groundwater and, mm -hmm. and some of the things that are environmentally outside your control, I would imagine you'd want to make sure that you're paying attention to those elements at yeah. that particular point in time. How does that how does that evolve in, in the education process for the operator? Yeah, it, it, that's a very interesting point um, to make. And in the answer is that we should be looking at all things all the time and that's not feasible. So, you know, the first stages is, is, you know, what is our, you know, and I guess if I had a new operator, the first stage is where is everything at, uh, you know, and where are my valves? How long are my pipe runs? How long is all this stuff goes out there? And, and the reason for that is, is that on my screen, the, the, the PNIDs that sit there, my valves look close, but they could be five miles apart. Yeah. And so what is the, if I slam this valve, what is the, what could happen here? What could happen there? And those are things that cause real incidences at the service and have real consequences to even downhole. Uh, so that's the first thing is know your facility, know what each valve does, know the closing time of each valve. Like that stuff needs to be covered. The downhole pressure and all that's almost like higher education. And, you know, we need to start, you know, looking at all that sort of stuff. But we have to be fundamentally really good operators, righty tighty, lefty loosey, right. really good uh, hygiene. You know, the place needs to be picked up. All that sort of stuff needs to happen. And then we can start to get more advanced. Um, you know, it's kind of the hierarchical period, pyramid. Let's bang out and make sure that this bottom stuff are, are really good. There's no use getting a fancy seismic monitoring system if if, if none of our valves work. Yeah. You know, the, we can't control the cavern anyway. So there's a bunch of things that we have to look at. And then those are incremental steps to get our facility. And I guess we'll use a buzzword to world class. Yeah. You know, there's, you know, there's a bunch of things that we can have. There. Well, it's a system. It's an entire system. And if you, if you lack in one area, it infects, it infects impacts the entire system there's no there's no shortage of okay i don't have to pay attention to this or that it's it's really it's a holistic goal in terms of in making sure that he has integrity and, and is yeah smooth. and the other the other thing that's pretty important for us to realize is a lot of people say well the regulators didn't tell us to do this that's not the way that the regulation set the bare minimum of what we need to do. And if we as operators or consultants know that something else should be addressed, we have to address it. And guess what? Usually it's the operator that's out there doing their daily rounds that's telling us that something's not right. right. Um, and so we gotta we have to understand that if we look at that whole circle, we set up some key milestones based on regulations. But in between each one of those key milestones, we as operators, consultants, and users need to understand that we can take intervention steps to ensure that we don't lose integrity of our asset and they need to be addressed. You know, deferred maintenance, is in, deferred maintenance happens, but it's, you know, it's one of those things you got to understand the risks for the, for the reason for it is deferring it. Yeah. Another question is, is what does API 1170 and 1171 regulate for underground storage? Yeah. The answer is nothing. Um, so API 1170, 1171 are recommended practices put together by a team of industry experts. Um, and it's just, once again, uh, recommended practices. Now, there has been events since the publication of those. Uh, Lisa Canyon happened and some other things. And so government groups like FEMSA and some of the states have taken those recommended practices and put them as the base layer of their regulations. Um, so, but as a document themselves or as a group themselves, they are not regulatory. They are recommended now as operators and consultants and, you know, other people out there, once we say that we have a recommended practice, industry recommended practice, that we should really look hard at implementing those at our facilities. And if we don't implement one, we need to have a reason why it's not implemented. Because if something is to happen, somebody's going to be like, well, 
the API 1170 said that you shall do this and you chose not to. Well, things change. Like, let's say, say we get a better tool, we get a better sonar tool, or we get down hole instrumentation that's better. Well, maybe I can't ignore it then, but I should have a documentation. The one thing I didn't address in this talk, and I should be stressed, is the MOC process, management of change. Why are we making changes? And, you know, that's some of the stuff that we had at the end. If we have a strong management of change process, and I'm going to be the first to say that as an engineer, I hate it. But the reasoning behind it is, is that all those changes are documented. This is why we're doing it. Yeah. This is the justification we're doing. This is the, and so API 1170 says that I shall do a, you know, some, some downhole tool. Well, maybe I have a permanent downhole tool in there and I don't need to do that. But in my MOC says, you know, this said this, and we chose to do this because it's above and beyond. Well, with now with knowledge management and especially, you know, as we're documenting things along the way, you have to have a chain of custody in terms of, what was then, what was the change, and what is now? And that allows people to go back historically and understand what the changes were and why they were made and yep. what the result was. And the cause yeah. and effect is huge in the environment. And I think yep. that's really important for people to understand. And like you said before, uh, world class, not, mm -hmm. not minimum viable product. <laughs> it's, yeah. you know, it's a world class environment and, it, and it's a, a, a working system. So, Another um, uh, question we had is, is operator qualifications or training required part of regulations? Yeah, that's an interesting topic or question. So um, in both API 1170 and API 1171, um, they state that the operator shall train its operators. They don't state how they are going to train them, but they just say they shall train them. Um, and FEMS has actually come through with their audits and said, well, what are you guys doing to train your operators? So is it a true regulation? The answer is sort of. Um, and, you know, you have to. I mean, the, the, you have to keep bringing people up and we have to keep doing stuff. Um, as a company, we have a whole, you know, I guess this is going to sound sales pitchy. We have a whole set of modules to help train uh, operators and bring them up to speed because there's a difference between operating in a petrochemical facility and operating a storage asset. Mm -hmm. the, the, you know, what's going on downhole, you know, what's going on in a, you know, distill column versus what's actually going down downhole in a cavern. There's some, there's some differences and those things should be addressed. So, you know, we should have everything from righty tighty lefty loosey on a valve to, you know, maybe what's going on geology wise. So, uh, you know, those things need to happen and they need to be documented. Now, what your company chooses to do as far as that, is it one hour a year that you're training your operators uh, or so much as, you know, several companies are having weekly every year, they're having weekly, um, you know, trainings that are brought into each one of the facilities to ensure that, you know, people understand how that their facility operates, plus how the other facility operates that tie them together. So. Yeah. And, and I have to imagine that as an operator, you know, you're going to have specialties in different areas, you know, like the, the actual you know, valves and, and, and transport versus the actual uh, seismic information. That data and that discipline is, is somewhat different. So how, do, how does an operator uh, manage those different specialties in, <laughs> when, when yeah. there's a, an absence of, of, of um, training criteria. So what do you yeah, I think? They, yeah, I think that everybody needs to have a basic level. Like you should have a course that basically explains this is a salt dome. This is a salt cavern. This is the hydraulics that is part of the whole creation of the cavern. This is how product goes in and out. And that base level then it allows everybody to talk on the same jargon, it allows everybody to use the company how they want to go from there. Now, my operator that's operating the board doesn't need to understand the seismic network, but the two, per, you know, the person running the seismic network and the guy that's operating the board should be able to talk a common language such that we can get ideas across. He's like, well, I saw this pressure spike. And then, they're, you know, they go, well, I saw a bunch of events. And then maybe between the two, they can come up with a cause of what, could have happened. Uh, but we have to get that base level of jargon or that base level of understanding or else it's really tough to get ideas across, especially on a, a very unique specialized um, facility.
Yeah, absolutely. Communication is key. Do you know what PHMSA doing in terms of audits and operations due to COVID-19? Are the audits still being conducted? Yeah, FEMSA. Uh, FEMSA is still doing audits, um, you know, because they just they have a bunch of them. Uh, I don't know exactly how they're, whether they're still on site or what's going on. Um, and it's, you know, that's, uh, I could find some of that stuff out if somebody needed to know those answers. Yeah, it's really key to understand, uh, you know, what the industry is doing. So what are the big changes in the, and uh, any kind of um, adjustments are being made in the industry that you're seeing or you're noticing? Yeah, so what we're seeing quite a bit is new caverns are going up in um, size, not the size of the caverns themselves, but the the well size itself. Uh, and you know, as we go up in size from 16 inch to 20 inch to 24 inch completions, and, and the reason for it is deliverability of product. Uh, the problem we have is, is that we don't have the same quality of tools to inspect casing to do some of the tests that we need on the larger casings. Um, it also, you know, 24 inch is no longer an API casing size. We get into line pipe sizes there. So, you know, it was not designed to go down hole and do what we were doing. Not mm -hmm. to say that we can't overcome that with engineering and factors of safety. Um, we're just running into some, you know, some, we're pushing boundaries. Um, and so we're, we're slowly getting the technology there to be able to handle those situations. Um, but that's where we're headed. Everything's getting bigger, more deliverability, faster. Um, and there, there's a couple other ways to skin the cat that I think would be healthier for our caverns and our facilities. Um, but, you know, that's a little bit outside of this discussion. Well, and, and I, I know we have a few minutes left. So I, I guess what I'd like to ask is, are what are some of the questions that we're not asking as an industry that may be uh, important for us to think about or consider as we're as we're expanding capacity, expanding capability, and uh, in, in the caverns and the capacity of, of storage? What what are some areas that you're seeing that you know? Because every day we learn something new, and every day we expand on our information from looking at data that that's in existence, and you know maybe some of this has been around for decades. And there's always, uh, you know, improvements coming on board. So can you expand on some of the improvements and understanding that uh, you're seeing and, and some of the trends that might be appearing for the future in Cavern? In yeah. I mean, the improvements, we're doing a good job as an industry. I mean, if we look at it, our number of incidences are, is extremely low. And one thing that's really nice is as a media, SALT itself is really friendly it's just when things go really bad, things go bad. Yeah. What we're seeing is, is a difficulty and what needs to be addressed is, is that, that geology piece, you know, the, the good locations. If, if we look at, you know, our big energy hubs, we're running out of locations on those hubs and the infrastructure to get pipelines and con connectivity is tough. We've got lots of salt out there, but the connectivity to get it to the, you know, the fractionators and the distillery and all that sort of stuff, it just isn't there. And that's a lot of money to get it. So what we're doing is we're now talking and we're squeezing caverns and spaces they shouldn't have ever been done. The hard part of it is, is that we're starting to push our geomechanics and all of that stuff to the limits. We don't, we, we sort of think we understand what's going on and we've got pretty good constant models. But at the end of the day, what my four inch core tells me versus what a 5 million barrel cavern is, it's pretty tough to, to scale things and say, this is the exact behavior. The other thing that we do quite a bit, you know, and needs to be improved upon is, is that we run geomechanical models for when we lay out a facility, we don't really run models after the facility has been built. And the, the added cost is, 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 a, is a great cost, but you know, it's kind of like building a part and then putting it on a racetrack and then we should do testing afterwards to ensure that it can handle that, yeah. that those stresses and strains. And so those are some of the improvements we probably need to do is, you know, the geology and, you know, how is everything happening and how is the salt behaving? And that's kind of the reason why I chose the two discussion points today, which is seismic monitoring and subsidence, is that that is a way that we can directly 
kind of infer what's happening to the salt mass. Um, mm -hmm. Because if we put caverns in or we change behaviors of those caverns, that salt itself is going to tell us the story of what it's trying to accomplish. So I would imagine over several decades, uh, the infrastructure in that salt dome is, is and that uh, that whole system will make changes. So I would I would have to imagine that uh, there's there's some new improvements in measurements and in some of the ways that we're we're uh, projecting those changes out and managing that as an operator. Are there uh, are there going to be? Do you see any uh, new tools that are arriving that uh, will give yeah. us more visibility into what's taking place in the dome? Yeah, I mean, so, not in the dome in particular, but you know, we're getting really. Uh, there's some interesting new things that are coming out. Uh, University of Houston and some other colleges have, are looking at uh, instrumenting the cement. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, can it, and then also putting stuff in that can be activated to reheal it if it if it breaks down. Um, you know, that's, you know, from nanobots, other things. So there's some really cool research coming out there. Uh, we are, we now have the ability to run fiber optic tubing on outside of casing and inside of casing uh, that allows us to directly monitor and measure what's going on in our caverns. Um, uh, several companies are using downhole probes that are telling them exactly the behavior uh, on injection and withdrawal of their gas caverns. So we're seeing a ton of really good instrumentation and people taking some chance is, uh, you know, the, to, to put in a downhole probe, you know, that's many hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, you know, if it doesn't give you data back, it's, it's, it's tough to tell that to your management. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I just spent a couple of hundred thousand. I didn't get anything back. That's a tough one to swallow. Yeah. So, so uh, I think we already answered the uh, other question. What's the optimal monitoring data interval for uh, effective risk mitigation? Is that, yeah. That the answer to that yep. question? Uh, and then also there's, uh, there's, this question is coming from social media. Um, as far as, uh, there's some other questions. Let me make sure that, uh, I check this questions coming out. Uh, let me check in the feed here, see if there's anything else going here. Cause I know there's, there's a lot of topics that we, I mean, we covered a lot of ground, and I just want to make sure that we're having everything that uh, – there's a lot of talk about hydrogen. What do you anticipate the storage needs will be? Oh, in hydrogen? Yeah. yeah, hydrogen's an amazing thing. I think uh, – I've been saying it for a long time. Hydrogen's going to be with the, probably the future energy source. And if we look at a cavern itself, uh, if we have cheap solar, cheap wind – we have the ability to crack water pretty easy and, you know, basically a cavern becomes the biggest battery there is uh, mm -hmm. with, you know, an ultra clean source. You know, Europe is looking at it pretty hardcore. And I see, I see a lot of assets possibly being converted to a hydrogen storage. There's some difficulties with it. Hydrogen with certain steels becomes, makes the steel just become brittle. So there's some things that we have to overcome. Uh, but as an industry, we understand how to store gas and salt, and we actually know how to store it in, you know, in reservoirs. There's just some technical stuff that needs to be evaluated and looked at. Uh, but there are hydrogen caverns currently in the United States in operation, um, and those are usually for refineries making uh, unleaded fuels. Uh, but we, there's a bunch of projects moving forward for hydrogen, and it's, it's pretty exciting. So. Well, and I, I think that you know this is one of the areas that the industry, and I think. Uh, Mark LaCour on his keynote suggested is the industry has been very good at being uh, a closed loop system because of the absence of a lot of this information and the exciting news. Cause a lot of the technologies and the techniques and some of these things that are out there in the industry are very exciting. You know, they're very mm -hmm. forward thinking and, you know, with hydrogen, that's, a, that's another area that I, I see could be a growth area. One of the other questions we have is uh, from social media is how finite is un under undeveloped storage? Oh, finite. We've, we've got a lot of salt out there. Uh, you know, uh -huh. how finite it is, is it, 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 I'll tell you straight up is that it comes down to economics. Um, we have enough salt out there for us to pretty much store everything we need. And then the other thing that's really important for us to understand is once we have the space created, 
that's a multi-generational space. Now, what happens is our well bores and our well heads, those do deteriorate. So what we can do is if we design everything properly is that we can plug one well bore and we can re-drill into that cavern and get our space back. We have to make sure that we do things properly and we don't cause a leak pass and other things like that. But that space, you know, like I said, you know, the first caverns weren't developed, but the first caverns kind of for storage were in the 1940s. Those mm-hmm. caverns are still going strong. So, you know, that's, you know, 60, you know, that's 80 years old. Yeah. Um, you know, we don't, we probably don't have a surface tank that's still working like that. Um, you know, of any volume that makes us any money. Of course, we can go to Spindle Top and see those old service tanks that are sitting there. But, um, you know, that's it's pretty important for us to, one, nowadays design an asset that can is future-proof and, two, design the shape and size of our caverns that are future-proof. But, you know, we've got – it comes down to interconnectivity and, you know, the need for that interconnectivity uh, that's going to drive whether, you know, we run out of salt or not. Yeah. One more last question, I believe, is with cheap capital and cheap commodities, is there a move to invest and store for higher prices? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's an interesting commercial discussion that probably should be done over beers. Um, Always welcome. <laughs> yeah, the, the, yeah the, the answer is, is, you know, a lot of these contracts are negotiated up front yeah. uh, for reservation and throughput fees. And so, you know, what part are we looking at for higher price? Are we looking at the cavern, you know, operator? Are we looking at the commodities trader that's, you know, trading into it? So that it's tough to answer that question because of that. Um, Yes, we have cheap capital and we have cheaper commodities, but uh, it still takes a certain amount of energy to move the product, still takes a certain amount of, you know, certain things. So uh, we are seeing higher prices, but that's also due to, the lack of connectivity. So I don't think there's, you know, we are seeing big pipeline projects, but we're not seeing these smaller pipeline projects to connect, you know, different hubs, different energy hubs. Mm. Some of that pipes in the ground, but you know, it's just maybe not utilized or, you know, we need to put bigger pipe in there. So I think that's where it needs to probably, probably be, but that's a, that's a tough one. Sorry. I can't answer that one straight up. We need more. Um, well, that's okay. I, I think the, I, I think the point in in what Spark Thought and uh, SparkCon 2020 is bringing to the table is the conversation around what is possible. How are we moving forward in the future? And there's a lot of energy going into making things better, improving the industry, improving the outcome and the education around the industry. So I think it's really important for us to understand what is possible in, in the direction we're moving. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Joel, for everything you brought to the table today and the great conversation. I am by no means an expert or anything that uh, uh, really understands all the details of everything. So thank you so much for, for uh, sharing your expertise and understanding in the cavern and the storage and, and some of the things that are bringing uh, new opportunities to the industry. I really appreciate it. And and SparkCon 2020 will continue to grow and evolve this week. And this information is available online. If you like it, comment, share. And if you caught it after the live event took place and you've seen this elsewhere, you know, this is uh, this is something that's going to be ongoing and the information is going to be here. So ask the questions, start the conversation and make sure that we're moving forward as an industry and helping each other grow and be successful in the future. So any last parting words or any information you want to share that uh, we can actually uh, use words of wisdom? Words of wisdom. No, uh, you know, thank you guys very much for allowing me to present here today. Um, You know, the the topics are great and, you know, they're opening people's minds hopefully a little bit. I appreciate you guys uh, listening in to my little piece. Uh, If you guys have any questions, just reach out to me. Um, You know, phone calls and emails are pretty easy uh, and I accept them all. So um, once again, thank you guys, everybody, for letting me participate. Fantastic. And SparkCon 2020 continues this afternoon. We're going to be talking. uh, We have another session. Uh, Please. Register at sparkcon.today and make sure that you have registered for the events. Notifications are turned on and you have an opportunity to collect and get involved in this information. 
knowledge management is a, a key ingredient in all the industries. And once we share knowledge, we meet, need to make sure that we're understanding what it means to us, how we address it, and how we continue to improve on it. So thank you so much for being here today. And we look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Take care. Thanks, all.